Analgesics are a different type of drug. Analgesics are drugs that are um, painkillers or pain relievers, and they basically reduce or inhibit the perception of pain. They tend to uh, not have an effect on the cause of the pain or the injury, but they will minimize uh, our sensation of pain. All right? And how does that work? Our body, our nervous system, has uh, pain receptors throughout the body which are activated um, by or stimulated by prostaglandins. All right? Prostaglandins are chemical messengers that are found and uh, released uh, by uh, damaged cells. All right? Here are some general uh, structures of uh, prostaglandins. Don't worry too much about the structure. Uh, we won't really be needing them, but it's just so you can see that these chemicals are what are there. Now, prostaglandins are released by uh, damaged cells and are responsible for what we call the inflammatory response. Inflammatory response includes swelling, all right? Prostaglandins will cause increased blood flow, and that swelling will um, allow for more uh, white blood cells to come and infiltrate through uh, the tissues, but it also uh, swells to immobilize, for example, if you have uh, a joint problem, it will swell that so you don't move that joint in order to try to protect the area. You'll have also, they also cause the increase in temperature, uh, what we normally call fever, uh, that's in order to have the reactions t uh, happen quicker. So basically, if you're doing an immune response, you want those, the rate of that reaction to be faster. So that's why we have an increase in temperature. And obviously, uh, they're also responsible for pain sensation, which is in order for you to remove your uh, hand or an injured part from whatever is causing that injury. Uh, that's why we sense um, pain when we put our hand on a fire or something like that. So, an analgesic must be able to stop the pain message from reaching the brain and, a the brain and actually being perceived, being analyzed as um, pain. So there's two uh, general mechanisms through which this happens. Um, mild analgesics tend to do this by blocking uh, prostaglandin production at the site of injury. So uh, the prostaglandins are not released or they are uh, broken down and therefore they cannot activate uh, the pain receptors. All right. Um, um, mild analgesics are known normally as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Uh, and they tend to be excellent at uh, stopping uh, mild pain, being anti-inflammatory, they reduce the inflammation because they stop the inflammatory response, and they're also antipyretic, i.e. they reduce uh, fever. Uh, one uh, particular uh, mild analgesic, paracetamol, uh, known as acetaminophen here in the U.S., uh, is a mild analgesic uh, that acts by inhibiting prostaglandin release in the brain, all right, rather than at the site of injury. Um, prostaglandins cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. We'll talk more about that in uh, further uh, videos or uh, later in this video itself. But um, prostaglandins cannot cross that barrier, so they must be re-released uh, in the brain. Paracetamol uh, stops that uh, release in the brain, so Paracetamol is not able to stop swelling like other NSAIDs can, but it still uh, can release, uh, relieve pain, mild pain, and it can still uh, act as an antipyretic because uh, temperature regulation is uh, controlled in the brain, all right, or in the um, upper uh, nervous system. Strong analgesics, uh, and we're going to talk about opioids or opiates, all right, actually act in a different form, uh, form or fashion. They act on the brain itself and they literally block the pain receptors, all right, and therefore by blocking the receptors that where those um, prostaglandins would actually bind and stimulate the sensation of uh, pain that then would be analyzed um, by the brain as, as that message that is pain, um, these analgesics will bind there and block uh, the, the prostaglandins and so we cannot feel, we do not uh, feel the pain at all. All right. Uh, these strong analgesics also have an effect on your alertness and the mood uh, and because they affect 
your brain and your perceptions, they are considered narcotics. All right? Any substance that affects uh, your perception by acting directly on your brain is considered a narcotic. So let's go ahead and look at some of those uh, different um, analgesics. All right? The analgesics uh, that you're going to use are going to be depending on the type or, or severity of your pain. For mild to moderate pain, you're going to use more mild analgesics. We're talking about aspirin, ibuprofen, paracetamol, things like that. As uh, the pain persists and becomes stronger, you're going to use uh, mild opiates or mild opioids. Opioids, all right? Like codeine. If the pain continues and it gets stronger and stronger, you will need to use uh, a stronger um, alternative, and you will use some strong opioids, all right? such as morphine. In some countries, uh, it is legal to use, uh, sorry, it is legal to use uh, heroin, but that is not a everywhere, so that's not as common. Um, and the reason for that is because any of the strong opioids have a risk of dependence, so normally you will um, try to use the mildest possible analgesic before moving on, and uh, obviously the strongest ones uh, are prescribed and must be administered by medical professionals. All right. So if we're looking at mild analgesics, let's start by looking at aspirin. Aspirin, otherwise known as acetyl salicylic acid. All right. Acetyl salicylic acid is a derivative of salicylic acid. As salicylic acid is uh, a natural compound found in willow bark, and it's been known since antiquity to act as an analgesic to remove relieve pain. The problem with salicylic acid is that it's very acidic, all right, and it caused bleeding of the gums, it caused bleeding of the stomach, and so eventually, luckily in uh, the 1800s, a derivative uh, made by uh, Mr. Bayer, uh, yes, famous from aspirin, all right, was uh, made, and uh, this ester derivative blocks this OH group over here, and we put an ester, we put an uh, acetate group or ethanoate group there, all right? Uh, if you want to see the structure with all the carbons, it would be a carbon here and this would be a CH3, all right? And at that particular point, it makes it a lot less acidic, less irritating. You can take it and it does not um, irritate your stomach as much, even though it still does that. Uh, once it is absorbed and it moves into the uh, small intestine, the alkaline um, conditions of, the, of that will break the ester. You'll reform salicylic acid, which is absorbed by the body, and acts as the um, analgesic. All right? Now, some of the side effects of um, aspirin include decreased blood clotting and blood thinning. All right? They can cause irritation to the stomach and to the small intestines, even though... Uh, it is less than uh, salicylic acid. It's still quite acidic. Uh, if you take it in excess, you could have acidosis of the blood, which is lowering of the blood pH. Uh, it can cause, in some people, allergic reactions. Some people are aller allergic to aspirin. And in children under the age of 12, it can lead to something that is called Ray's uh, syndrome. And Ray's syndrome is a rare liver and brain disorder that can, if it happens, lead to death. All the different side effects uh, that we experience or we see for uh, aspirin can be uh, increased by synergistic effects with alcohol. Synergistic effects just means that when acting with something else, it will cause the effects to be uh, more marked. Another um, analgesic that we can use is uh, ibuprofen, very similar uh, to the action of aspirin. It also is acidic, as you can see that it has a carboxylic group uh, here, and so it's still going to be uh, quite um, irritating on the stomach, even though it is milder than aspirin. It also has synergistic effects with um, alcohol, but different than aspirin, it does not cause Reyes uh, syndrome. Paracetamol, and by the way, the structures of both aspirin 
uh, ibuprofen, and paracetamol can all be observed in uh, your data booklet. All right. Paracetamol, uh, marketed uh, as Tylenol, is a mild analgesic that is uh, very safe to use. It's less acidic uh, if you're using it in normal uh, doses. All right. It has very few side effects. It does not cause uh, syndrome. It is mild to the stomach. It's non-allergenic. So all of these things make it excellent. Unfortunately, chronic use and overdoses can have severe um, liver, kidney, and brain cal uh, liver, kidney, and brain damage. And similarly to al uh, to aspirin and to ibuprofen, if taken uh, with alcohol, it can sig significantly increase this toxic um, side effects. All right. When we look at strong analgesics, we are looking at opioids, uh, derivatives from the opium poppy, and these particular substances are alkaloids. Alkaloids means that they are plant derivatives, all right, they're basic plant derivatives that contain a heterocycle and a tertiary amine. Okay, wait, what does that all mean? All right, so if we are looking for a heterocycle, a heterocycle is a ring that is composed of carbons and any other elements. We happen to have in this particular one, if we're looking at morphine, we're looking at two different rings that are heterocycles. We have a ring there that is composed of carbons and oxygen, five-member ring, and we have a six-member ring there that is composed of five carbons and one nitrogen. So those are the heterocycles. But that second one, I am going to uh, remove because I want to focus on something more important. I'm going to focus that that particular nitrogen there also is a tertiary amine. That means that the nitrogen is directly connected to three different carbon atoms. All right? So when we have this characteristic that is plant derived, that is basic, that it contains a heterocycle and a tertiary amine, we have the compound being an alkaloid. All right? Now, opioids act directly on the central nervous system, all right? And they act on the brain. They have to be able to go through the blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier is a fatty tissue that separates the normal bloodstream from uh, the brain in order to protect the brain from getting infected by other substances, all right? So in order to act on the brain, a drug must be able to go through the blood-brain barrier, or in short, the BBB, all right? And well, let's look a little bit about the structure of this. If we look at the structure of morphine, again, you have it on your data booklets, You'll, find, you'll see that it's mostly carbon and hydrogen bonds, so it's going to be relatively nonpolar. But it has two hydroxide groups, one here in blue and one here in red. It's got a little bit of an ether here with the oxygen that is bridging two carbons, and you have an amine. So it's going to have some polarity, and the hydroxides in particular make it polar enough that it slows down the passage of morphine through uh, the BBB. So the three most important opioids uh, that we're going to study are morphine, that is natural, it's uh, taken from uh, the poppy, uh, the opium poppy, codeine, which is found in small percentage as uh, in the pop in the poppy seed, but it also can be uh, modified from uh, morphine, and then heroin, which is normally produced uh, from uh, morphine by doing esterification. All right. So notice the differences. Uh, the structure is generally the same. Morphine being the natural one has two alcohol groups. One of those alcohol groups is modified into an ether group for making choline. And in the case of diamorphine or heroin, those groups are turned, are uh, esterified by putting ethanoates. Those will change the polarity overall of the entire molecule, this one, each one of those modifications, and make it more or less effective. 
Um, codeine is normally a moderate painkiller. It's used in uh, second stage painkiller management. It's used uh, in dental surgeries, cough syrups, and it's a short-term antidiarrheal. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Morphine is used as a strong painkiller, third stage management. Uh, remember the stages that we were talking about before. It is used for major surgery. Um, people um, who are suffering from pain of cancer, major trauma, fractures, all of these kind of things. And then uh, heroin is normally used as an illicit drug, but in some countries it is used in palliative care. Palliative care is when you cannot help a person any longer, but you are minimizing the pain they feel. And um, so you can actually give these very potent drugs. All right. So here are uh, the painkiller effect increases as we go from codeine to morphine to heroin, and so do uh, the side effects. So here are some of the side effects of opioids, all right? Constipation, cough suppressant, pupillary constriction. And then they also have narcotic effects, and we're going to focus on the narcotic effects of heroin. When people first take heroin, they have a feeling of euphoria, and that's because it has, because you don't feel so much, and one of the things that you don't feel is your internal organs, and so it actually feels, it makes you feel lighter, and that is going to lessen your fear, your tension, it's going to make you feel like you have more energy for a moment. As it kicks in, it's going to have a dulling uh, of the senses and of any pain, it will decrease uh, appetites, both uh, the feeling of hunger, but also sexual appetite is decreased. It has a decrease in libido. It causes lethargy, all right? And eventually, it causes uh, loss of consciousness. Long-term use will lead to tolerance, and um, tolerance requires you to use more of the drug, and therefore, um, you will get uh, dependence. And uh, in addition uh, to dependence, you can get addiction. It means you will have... Uh, withdrawal symptoms. When you have tolerance and addiction, normally there are going to be social consequences. You are going to need to get your fix of your drug, and therefore you do it by stealing, um, by um, prostituting yourself in order to get money for that. Uh, this can cause to, um, of course, exposure to uh, diseases like uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, to hepatitis C, um, and obviously if you overdose, it can lead to coma and to for death uh, and death. So why does heroin have so much a stronger effect than the other ones? And so let's just go back to the images, all right? The reason for heroin having such a stronger effect is that it's less polar than morphine, all right? And therefore, it can go through the blood-brain barrier much, much more readily than morphine and therefore be in larger concentration in the brain and interact with the pain, the pain receptors more readily. Let's look again here. Uh, if we look at this structure, uh, we can see, again, morphine has two hydroxide groups, two alcohol groups, which are very, very polar. When we look at heroin instead, those groups are significantly less polar. They're still polar, but because they don't have the OH bond, which hydrogen bonds, it is going to be uh, less. And this is what causes it to go through the BBB much more readily and actually work. All right. Thank you so much.